right, let me just uh, quickly refresh. Uh, we are alive. Wonderful. Cool. All right, so um, notification. Yeah, turn on. That's it. Okay. All right, guys. Good day and good afternoon. Um, today, so uh, we have very, I'm very honored to uh, invite Luke to give us uh, a talk uh, regarding complete picture. Um, talking about my personal experience. So, okay, for the last couple of years, I, I mean, the current photography world is full of um, tech formulas such as lighting and posing and you know we all talk about you know uh, come back the sun with hss with f1.4 anywhere at any time i mean those are beautiful images um but in a sense to me it's not complete image because photography world can be much more than that it's it's a form of art essentially essentially or finally like peter adams said great photography is about the depth of feeling not the depth of field. So from my personal experience, a couple of years ago, I was already been attending WPPF for a couple of years. I nerd from so many master photographers. I nerd lighting from someone, posing from someone else, and post-production from someone else. And uh, I can create typical silver awards image in a sense. However, um, the problem with me is all the knowledge that I've gathered that are fragmented, right? I was struggling to put everything together to complete my own vision or my own inspiration until I did a class with Luke as well as David. So I did their uh, offline masterclass as well as photo walk. And then of course, I, um, I, I think I did one of the best investment in my professional career, which is like, which is the beyond craft online classes. Um, I think that's the best thing ever happened to me. I literally had the enlightenment or you know the light bulb moments in my in my career. Um, so rather than talk further about this class or you know what what I have nerd myself, I I have invited the legend, the master photographer himself, <laughs> Luke Edmondson, to to share his views or um, his uh, professional sort of ideas. Um, about Luke, let's just um, let's let's talk about Luke. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, just in case uh, you guys haven't met him yet, uh, Luke Edmonds is a master photographer. He's a global speaker. He's an educator and a competition judge, and uh, he is also a grandmaster of WPPI. Also served as director, prince judge and chair yep. and he's also served in a speaker selection community of um, professional photographer america which is ppa he holds um the master photography and photographic um craftsman degrees and in uk he's the fellowship of, of swpp as well as the speaker and the judge and i guess everybody in, in ipp actually knows him because uh if, He's been the international photographer of the year, and he's been taking out the gold awards, like, um, like you know, swiping out of the gold awards. And he's also served as, a, a, you know, one of the most favorable judge in, on the judge bench. He's a husband. He's a great father, brother, and a son with two awesome kids, with a beautiful, beautiful wife. All right, so I'll leave everything else to Luke, and uh, let's uh, let's show we, let's get started, shall we? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Aries, uh, for inviting me to be on here. And I've already seen uh, quite a few of our friends that are joining. So that's huge. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Whatever time it is. Good night for me. Right. Uh, this is one of the topics that I'm most excited to talk about. And uh, the fact that Marcus Bell is on here, Marcus, this one's hey. really this is for you, buddy, because I think this is going to your brain has many wrinkles, my friend. And uh, and this is going to be a good one. Uh, so, uh, got a chat going on over here that I'll try and look over at, but primarily I'm just going to go into the presentation. Now, uh, everything that Aries said is true, but none of it matters other than the fact that, uh, I got a wonderful wife, wonderful kids. And, uh, and my goal as a photographer is to love on others and have influence in their lives. Uh, my excuse is I have a camera. 
Uh, accolades are going to come and go in your life as you go through a career. Uh, what I'm presenting to you today is uh, a reference point in my life that I would say is really only in the past three, four, five years that I've really been thinking along these terms. And uh, I'm about 25 years into my career at this point. I uh, grew up, uh, I'm a third generation photographer, so I've grown up uh, around photography all my life. And uh, it, it's just now that I'm finally starting to think along these lines. Now, what do I mean by uh, a complete picture? Well, you know, you go through Instagram, you look on Facebook. Why do some pictures stand out more than others? Why do some stand the test of time? Uh, why is it that you can go to a museum and look at a particular painting or sculpture, uh, listen to a piece of music uh, over and over and over again? Uh, what what keeps that that what keeps drawing you back? And so, as I'm taking a look at this, I'm reminded by this statement by a gentleman named William Mortensen, and he says, as you can read there, a picture must be looked at to be a picture. It's very self-evident. Uh, that statement. Now, a bit of context for who William Mortensen is. William Mortensen was an American photographer, most famous in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it was at the end of uh, an age that we call pictorialism. Uh, he was somebody who was intentionally kind of left out of the canonization of the history books, kind of out of some personal uh, friction between him and, and a group called the F-64 crowd. Uh, that group are the names that many of you will know, Edward Weston, Emojin Cunningham, Ansel Adams, and the like, um, just because they had a different vantage point about how they, they looked at the craft and, and the idea of picture making versus picture taking. Uh, to back up just a little bit further, uh, back in the 1800s, around 1853-ish, there was a guy named uh, Chapman Jones, who was very much a scientist and a chemist. And uh, this is at uh, kind of the wet plate photography times. But he eloquently put in the, uh, the preface to his book on the chemistry of photography that it's the principles of art and design that inform us as to what is aesthetically pleasing in our photographs. And then it's our craft that allows our preconceived ideas to become fully realized. When we talk about the idea of pre-visualization, that's something that we oftentimes associate. It's been popularized by Ansel Adams to our generation, but it goes back you know, much, much further. And I think what he's trying to teach us there is that uh, while it is very uh, popular for us to say that all art is subjective, uh, that's only true when we think about it in terms of aesthetics, how you feel or how you react to a particular piece of art. Uh, when we think about some of the other things that are perhaps a bit more objective, line, shape, color, form, mass, uh, these, these words that perhaps you remember from your primary school days or something along those lines, all of a sudden you realize we can actually talk in a quantitative way about something or we can describe it in a, in a way uh, that, uh, that starts giving some objective attributes, their qualities. So when he says here, a picture must be looked at to be a picture, what he's really trying to say it is that we have to create something that will grab somebody's attention. And so I've got just a few pictures here that have become uh, famous over time. Uh, perhaps uh, some of you may remember Cindy Crawford, who was a, a, a fashion model back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Naomi Campbell would be a name. Uh, when you really look at this shot, of course, you see the beautiful women and how they're joined together. Uh, but all of a sudden you start realizing the first thing you see is that beautiful mass, how they fit together, the gracefulness of their hands as they come together. We look at something like this and we realize that this was a transformative image uh, from the Vietnam War, War, definitely here in the States. Uh, you know, it shows a, a terrible moment, uh, but the way that's being depicted, but it stands the test of time in that it's an image that uh, many people will recall if they think about a particular moment in time. It's something that was transformative. Uh, another picture here, which many of y'all will know uh, from National Geographic. And, uh, you know, we look and we see the greenness of her eyes. We see the red fabric that's around her. 
And already there's a teachable moment beginning as we look at this, because what you'll notice, and part of what makes this picture so effective, obviously, is the color harmony and the color theory, the use of the complementary colors, the red on the green background. But what makes it truly powerful and why it really stands out is those tears in her fabric with that little bit of green. That's what adds to the repetition of the alternation of the red, green, red, green, back and forth. As we look at the background, we look at her eyes and we look at her shoulder. If you took your thumb and you covered up that area and you just had just her face and her eyes in the green background, it would be a strong image. But I'd suggest to you it's even stronger because we have that tear inside of her fabric. It also communicates to us that texture that's there. Um, the fact that it's a little rough around the edges, the wispy hair that's around her face. All these things are some of the strengths of what made this such a, a timeless photo. And of course, you have a picture like this, which anybody who's ever done print competition or things along those lines would say to you, you must never, ever, ever put the eye of your elephant right on the edge of your frame. Somebody out there is at least nodding their head to say, yes, I've been told time and time again, but we look at the way that she is so graceful, the way that her foot is planted, the upward thrust of her hands, the sense of gesture, the fact that the head of the elephant is turning away, the repetition of gesture of the elephant with its, with its uh, trunk curled upwards and its foot lifting tied down by that short chain. All these types of things are what make this picture when you say, how can something that technically is imperfect with an eye so close to the edge of the frame like that, how can it stand the test of time? And I would suggest to you it's for these very reasons. So when we think back about just the advent of photography, one of the people that comes to mind for me is a gentleman named Henry Peach Robinson. He was an English photographer who uh, became uh, very popular in the 1860s. And uh, he was doing a thing called combination printing. This was uh, in effect, uh, this was compositing in its day prior to the advent of the computer. They used multiple plates, each being a different exposure or a different scene. And then they would lay them down, those glass negatives, lay them down over the paper and then have uh, a new picture combined together. A lot of times it was using needle and thread. And when you actually look at some of the prints, you can see uh, where those holes were to help things be able to line up. Talk about pre-visualization. I mean, that takes a tremendous amount. This picture is called Fading Away. It was very controversial in its day, uh, but we look at it now and we simply say to ourselves, what a remarkable work of art that it is. Ironically, as just an aside, Henry got so much notoriety for doing this. Uh, he had some very good patrons. They were the King and Queen of England who offered to buy one of everything that he ever did. He embarked on kind of what I'll call the world tour of its day to talk about this, this approach to printing. And after three years of doing that, going to all the different camera clubs of the world and talking about it, um, he never did it again. And he just became a strict portrait photographer, single capture in camera. And I think that's interesting, just the arc that we go through as artists. Sometimes we were in an exploration phase and we do something and then suddenly, you know, it reaches a terminal point for us. We've, uh, we've explored it as far as, as we desire to go and then we change. And oftentimes our peers or others may wish for us to just remain exactly where we were because they just love exactly what we're doing at that particular moment. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is we have permission to continue to evolve. Um, one of the guys that had inspired Henry when we think about six different prints being combined uh, was Reislander. And he was the one who used uh, 60 different prints or, or, or frames to create this image a few years before Henry Peach Robinson. And, you know, we look at it, it looks like almost, you know, a, a Renaissance piece of, uh, of art, the way that he was able to uh, arrange each of these figures, shoot them individually. And then if you can just imagine how long it took, which my understanding is the development of the uh, prints into a, a final print with all the different combination things could often take two weeks. And so of being exposed in the sun. So if all of a sudden you had something off, uh, it was a real bear to have to go back and try and, and and restart the whole process. But we look at this and we admire it for its craft, for its skill, but also for its art. This is my moment of becoming an award-winning photographer. You know how we all update our bios and we say, 
my goodness, not just my mom thinks I'm great, but somebody else out there in the world does. Well, this was it. And I'll just give you a little background. You know, there's a an Australian photographer who we all admire named Nirvant. And uh, I'd heard him talk and he had shared the insight of if you just simply set your camera to tungsten and shoot in daylight, it makes the daylight go blue. And if you put a tungsten light on the, the person, all of a sudden, then you're going to have, you know, a, a cleaner quality and, and color of lighting to the individual. And so that's what I did here. But why this stands out is because up until this point in my career, in terms of weddings, I was pretty much a 7200 stack them up, knock them down type photographer. It was my go-to lens. This was the first time in my career that I ever saw an opportunity that I said, this would be perfect for my wide angle lens. And so I, I used it on this shot and I used that, you know, lighting trick. And so was able to accomplish this and uh, entered it into a competition early on in my career and it won. And, you know, what it did is it gave me a sense of confidence. Unfortunately for me, I wasn't as smart as William Mortensen because he created some pictures. This is one of his that he had done. He, uh, he was creating some pictures uh, that he had access to Cecil B. DeMille, who was a famous American director's uh, prop closet. And so he did a lot of stuff playing off the horror themes. But what his bread and butter was, how he made his money, is he was shooting all the Hollywood starlets. And so he would take pictures of girls like this. He would shoot pictures of girls like this. And you look at it and you say, it's beautiful, it's clean, it's classic. Uh, perhaps the flower is a bit too small. Perhaps there's a tangency between uh, how her hand is, her wrist is intersecting with her body. But I mean, come on, good sellable work consistent with professional practice. But he created this shot, Salamang. And all of a sudden he entered it in a competition and all of his work before that he had entered, the work that he was doing like this was always sent back, as he says, with regards. In other words, thank you, but no thank you. We're not going to accept your work inside of our salon, our print competition of its day. But then suddenly this picture became his first one. And he said to himself, why is this picture? What about this picture? How is it that this picture is the one that suddenly is getting clamor and acclaim and attention? It is said uh, in his writings that when he got this print back from entering it in all the different salons around the world, he entered it in multiple different print competitions. When it came back, there was not room on the back for another postage stamp uh, because of how popular this picture became. And of course, you look at it and you say, well, the value of her forearm is not uh, the same as the value of her chest. Uh, the hand that's down there in the basket is all splayed out. The head is at an awkward position. What is it that could make this picture so great? And so he explored that idea. And what he decided was all the rules in the world don't do you any good if you don't have a picture to start with. And it set him on a path to figure out a formula for not only a good, but what we call an effective picture. What makes a picture stand out on Instagram more than any other? What makes you, when you're scrolling, stop and go back to look at it? I see somebody saying rules are meant to be broken. You know, rule 101 is know the rules. Rule 102 is once you know the rules, break them. But I would also suggest to you that rules are your friend. They're just principles. They're guidelines. To call it a rule, even in the context of the rule of thirds, they said, the painter that established that rule said, if you must call it a rule, go ahead. But really, it's just a principle. Here's what I've observed. And so rule 103 would be, once you know the rules and you know that you can break the rules, why would you? In the sense of those are the very design elements that you can leverage to create an effective picture. So how do we get somebody to stop and look at our picture? Well, the answer that Mortensen found out is a picture must, by its mere arrangement, make you look. Now, what is arrangement? Arrangement is just composition. In fact, one of the things that Mortensen discovered is there were really only three ways to create impact. And I'll just give you an aside on this for myself. You know, if I was to ask in the chat, and we can even do it, but, you know, what is your definition of impact? How many of you would have a good one that you're fully satisfied with? I sure didn't. 
it took a lot of time for me to get to a point that I really came to a definition of impact that I was satisfied with, that really made sense to me. Because every time I heard somebody else's, I'd agree with them to a point, but then suddenly they might say something where I said, well, I, I'm not quite sure that's exactly it. A lot of times people might say impact is the emotional response you get when looking at something. Uh, people talk about feelings in terms of impact. Uh, people talk about sometimes how the lighting has tremendous impact or different things along these lines. And I'm going to get to my definition of what impact is, but let's keep going for just one second. So after we look, what's the next thing that we need to do? Well, the next thing is we start to see. And seeing is a very active process. It's different than looking, right? Looking is grabbing our attention. Seeing is where we start to really explore. What happens after that? Well, we need to be rewarded for that time spent. We need to enjoy whatever it was that we were looking at for whatever reason, there has to be something rewarding of value for the transaction of our time and energy spent into that, put into that experience. So what is it that we need to do if we're going to create a complete picture versus an incomplete picture? Well, a complete picture must speak with authority. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's got to uh, grab our attention in a dominant way. It's got to ring a bell. It's got to um, strike the gong. It has to do something that clamors for our attention. But then once it's done that, once it's grabbed our attention, it's got to have something to say. There has to be that value in the process of looking at it. Otherwise, you just quickly swipe and go by and go on to the next thing, looking for something that you can really sink your teeth into. So how do we do that? Well, the formula for that would be to first understand the laws and emotions of looking, right? And so when we think about it, we can look at a picture like this. This is one of Mortensen's pictures. And when you look at this and I say, okay, what do you truly see here when you look at this picture? Well, I'd suggest to you that what you see is you see a man's face that's underlit. It's suggesting to be a little bit horrific in the way it is, a little mysterious. There's a black mass underneath him. You see his hand extending from that same darkness. And as the light comes around it in a harsh manner, you see the curve of the finger coming up to the staff. Your eyes go into and look at the crown above his head and the iconic type elements that are on there. And then above, all of a sudden, you see the arms extended in almost a sense of religious and iconic different matter, whether it's a cherub or if it's Ganesh or all sorts of different things, but all these different layers that are put together. Whether you like horror or not, there is a lot visually that is interesting that Mortensen has put into his picture here. So now you have a picture like this from Kelly Tunney. She's a wedding photographer out of Australia. What do you see when you look at this? And I'll just share with you the responses that I often hear from people when I do this in a live setting. And the answer is they say, I see color, I see circles. I see shoes and then I'll press them. I say, what do you see? And they'll start to look and they'll say, I see on this green circle that's kind of in the middle area, I see two pairs of shoes. And then I'll say, what do you see? And they continue to look and they continue. I see cowboy boots in the lower right. What do you see? All of a sudden they look up in the top right and they see a cane and a single pair of shoes. What do you see? And they look and to the left of that is an empty space. And you realize all that's going on in this story that you realize that on a wedding day, she's captured not just the bridal party, but the wedding attendants, every guest, in a manner that tells us something about those people, but it also tells the story of her family. You realize that there's an old one, her grandfather, who's lost someone next to her. That's the emptiness that you feel when you look in there. You realize there's a difference in sizes in the way that she's arranged this and she's given dominance to certain areas. This is a well-crafted, well-conceived image that uses color. And that's one of the things that we can use in terms of impact. We can use arrangement or composition. We can also use color as a way to be able to create impact. You look at something like this by a gentleman named Peter Eastway, who's out of uh, Australia as well. I've seen a lot of pictures of sheep. I think this was taken somewhere in New Zealand or something like that uh, from memory. 
but what you see here is almost that David Hockney idea of the passage of time. You know, David Hockney explores time by doing his collages with his pictures. But of course, what we have here is Peter has captured this herd of sheep that are on the mountain. It's an interesting use of selective color. It works. It creates the sense of the mass of the sheep. You realize that all the sheep in the middle are sharp because they're not moving as quickly, whereas he's allowed the long exposure to create that motion blur as it goes around. And you say to yourself, oh my goodness, this is applied intelligence being put into the craft of photography and presenting me something visually interesting to be able to look at. Now I'll show you some of our pictures. This is one of my pictures of my father's and don't worry. Um, and he is a photographer for those that don't know. He's a grandmaster himself. I look up to him like crazy. He's taught me so much and I'm fortunate to have him as a dad. But when we look at this picture now, we say, oh my gosh, our client was so happy with this picture. But what do we see now when we look at it? Well, my eyes almost want to go into that void, which is in between her bosom, right? That, that dark space that's there. We've made it so dominant. My eyes look and they all of a sudden say, oh my goodness, look at that nose extending from her face, the way that it goes over her lips and it breaks the plane. Look at the pillows and the way that there's creases in it and so forth. The idea of the leading lines and the checkerboard and stuff like that coming in, it all works. You know, there's foreshortening going on in her arms. There's pressure from the way her hands are put down. But at the end of the day, you know, this is a serviceable client image. It rep represented where we were at the time. But now when we look at it, we say there's so much that we could have done that would have improved this image instead of just being content exactly where it is. I mean, as you actually look at it more and more, you realize there's not even the sense of a neck there. It's just a head on top of a mass. And so it'd be wonderful if we could have, uh, have done something along those lines. And pulling my pants down, here's a picture that I took. So, you know, I'm in New York. It's the naked cowboy. I want to grab a shot. I don't really know where to look in this picture. You can see what happens in a picture de devoid of arrangement, devoid of composition. Was I so enamored with the reflection that I wanted to get that? If you really look at it, there's a shot somewhere there between the guy and his bum and the girl he's with and the reaction of the people on the side, the expression of the open mouth, the woman with her phone, the guy kind of laughing and the girl with her hands over her head. But if I just sit back and look at this, I go, should I really be looking over here to the right hand side? You know, because of the fact that that's at least a, a little bit better composed type picture over there that's on the billboard. Or should I be looking at the text that's going on in the background? Where should I look? This is where I failed, right? I didn't have arrangement. I didn't give you a reason to look. This is the type of picture that we'd all just swipe right by. So when we talk about the laws of looking and the emotions, one of the things to remind ourselves is that where do feelings play out? Feelings play out in the theater of our minds. That's where feelings play out. So where do emotions play out? Emotions play out in the theater of our body, right? If you want proof of this for any of you that are in a relationship, just ask yourself how many times you've been watching a movie and felt something, an emotional blip, you started crying, and you look over and stare at your partner, and they're just sitting there straight ahead, not feeling at all any of the things that you're feeling, right? And you almost want to elbow them and be like, hey, why aren't you experiencing the emotions that I'm experiencing right now? And you realize that two people don't share the same emotional experience very often at the exact same time. We know this from weddings, where all of a sudden we say, you know, when the bride comes down the aisle, she's do, her emotions are one thing. She's been, been behind the door waiting for it to open up. The groom's been at the front, standing there in front of everybody else, just waiting. The doors come open. Everybody stands up. He can't even see her half the time. And then all of a sudden she gets close, right? The two people are having very different uh, emotional experience, even though it's occurring at the exact same time. Now, their feelings might be similar but the emotions are different. Now, why do people have different emotions? Well, they have different emotions based off of their previous experience with their feelings. And their feelings are shaped by positive and negative experiences 
around particular events in their life, around things as simple as color. You know, you're going to have a color that's your favorite. And so it makes you feel good. You're going to have other colors that are not your favorites. And so you don't feel as good when you put them on. So you default to going back to the ones you feel good about. Ironically, one of the things you can actually do is if you'll start making new memories in new colors or new wardrobes or new whatever, you'll actually change the way you feel about those things over time. So when we understand that, that, that feelings are going to happen here and emotions happen here, we can then start trying to bake the suggestions of those things into our artwork. Now, I see plenty of different advertisements that are out there of people telling you how you can manipulate people's emotions and stuff like that. I would, I would say to you that's not true. You can suggest to somebody how they're going to feel, but you cannot predict what their emotional response is going to be. And I've experienced this even in my own life when I've had work where I've asked people to describe the feelings that they get from it. And the answers are as varied as uh, as the number of answers. And what you ultimately realize is each time somebody describes their emotional experience, what they're really telling you is about themselves. It's not anything to do with how I intended the picture or what I created it as or anything, how I felt during the process. It's all about their emotional response to it. So impact, what is it really? Well, it's ringing a bell, it's striking a gong. You can think of it in this way. Our viewing audience is like a boulder that's sitting on a hill. And nothing is going to make that boulder roll down the hill unless it has something that strikes it. Some force has to occur that gets that boulder moving. Now, once it starts rolling down the hill, will it roll on its own? Absolutely. But it's not going to move on its own. It's going to take something to make it happen. And so you have three ways to do it. You can do it with arrangement. You can do it with color or you can do it with values. When that's typically when we're talking about in black and white photography. So I said here, it needs to ring a bell, sound a signal, speak a command. Our, our audience is, is like a heavy stone on a hill. They have inertia. Once we grab their attention, here's the interesting thing that I've discovered about impact. Impact occurs before we know what something is or even if it pleases us. And here's what I mean. All of us have had the experience of a double take. You've been walking down the street and then suddenly something stops you and you have to go back and look at it. Maybe it was a display that somebody was trying to sell something and you wanna see what that, that cute outfit was. Maybe it's that you're walking along and all of a sudden you saw two people doing something and, uh, and that grabbed your attention. So you have to stop and turn and look again, right? You don't know how you feel about it. You don't know if you're even gonna like it but something grabbed your attention and made you look. That is impact. Now, in art, when we talk about the rules, there are four popular compositions we can use that were identified by Mortensen. These are not the only forms of composition. Composition is both theoretical and instinctual, right? It shouldn't be only about theory and following design principles, but we do know that certain patterns are quick to be recognized by humans. And if you start looking at all the different advertisements, look at your Instagram and so forth, the ones that grab your attention, generally speaking, are going to fall along these, these four groupings. What are they? Well, we have the diagonal. We have the S shape, the S curve, the suggestion of a snake. We have triangles, which are sharp. We have the dominant mass, which is the lower one in the bottom right. So those are the four most popular forms of composition that generally speaking, grab people's attention. Hey, Nick, good to see you, buddy. Okay, so after it grabs our attention, what happens next? Well, here's the thing to keep in mind about impact. Impact is pervasive. It extends through the entire duration that we look at something. So it's both the beginning, the initial thought, and it's also the end. And here's how I'll lay that out for you. If you go to see a movie, and I'll give you an example. When I, when I do this uh, in a longer form, form of presentation, I'll oftentimes show the opening scene of uh, John Wick, 
John Wick 2 specifically. If you went and watched it, he's on a motorcycle, he's going, you don't even see the motorcycle. You don't even see John Wick. All you do is you hear the sights and sounds and colors. And then suddenly at the end, there's just enough symbolism that's brought in to let you know that there's some sort of transaction going on. You see John Wick's feet, but that's all that you get to see for the, say the first minute and a half, minute and 50 seconds. And in filmmaking, it's called the tone of the film. But as long as they create, they keep up that same level of excellence, energy, excitement, enthusiasm, and so forth that they established right there in the beginning, all the way to the end, you're going to come walking out feeling great about that movie. If at any point it wanes, that's when all of a sudden we say to ourselves, you know, it didn't match uh, in the end. It was an okay type thing, or it fell apart in some ways. It dragged in some ways. It was slow, whatever you want to call it. But something about it, the impact for you was lessened. The initial impact was not there all the way to the end. But in great artwork, it's pervasive. From the moment you first look at it till the moment you walk away, the impact is there. So is that it? Is that all it takes to create a complete picture? Is just creating impact? No. Because what happens after impact is both recognition and appreciation. See, all of a sudden we recognize that that is a triangle. We recognize it's a dominant mass. We recognize it's an S curve. We recognize it's a diagonal. But now we start to appreciate it. We start to look into it, right? This is that next part where we start to see, right? It's the active phase as our eyes move in and around throughout the pictures. So here are some examples when we start to see them. When, when we look at this, this is by Mandarin Montgomery, another Australian photographer. These people are all friends. And so that's why I use these pictures because I think they're really great illustrations. But when you first look at it, the initial things that you see is you see the archways, you see the vanishing point, you're brought in to the submarine in the background. You get kind of a sense of the fact that this is a fantasy type scene, the idea of the jellyfish being in the background and so forth. Of course, you recognize that there's a man there. You see the circle around his head. You suddenly discover if you hadn't already seen it initially because of the dark value that she used in order to draw your eye and attention to it, the animal, monkey, dog, whatever it is you want to call it, that's down there. But only after you spend a significant amount of time seeing, for many of us, will we suddenly notice that in the stoic manner that the guy is presenting himself in all this, there's a bit of a cheeky uh, finger gesture that's going on on his left hand. And so you start realizing there are little rewards that she's baked into this composition that give us something of value for the transaction that it happens when we spend time looking at it. On a simpler level, we have something like this. This is by Kelly Brown, who many of you may know out of Australia. We think of her for her baby and maternity photography, family photography, and so forth. But she's an excellent conceptual photographer. When you look at this, what do you see? Well, you see the white dog. You see the urn. You see that there's a little dog collar that's on that urn. You realize the sense of loss. Why do you realize that there's a sense of loss? Well, to our minds, um, any object that we place in a scene has the weight of that object in reality. And here's what I mean. She could have used a prop urn that was made out of plastic. And to our eyes, we would have said that is an urn and it should weigh this much. But because she used a real urn that had significant weight to it, what makes this picture work so well and where the tension comes from is those lines that lead down into the depression. And we feel the magnitude and the weight of the fact that this was once this dog's friend, brother, sister, mother, father, whatever it was to the other dog. And we realize in the composition that idea of how we should make the arrangement work she split it up here intentionally to have our eyes bounce from the left side to the right side and to the left side and to the right side and go back and forth and back and forth and cross that middle plane. And it's by doing that back and forth, the alternation that's occurring there, that it gathers strength and we feel the magnitude of the sense of loss. You look at something like this from Tony Hewitt. Another Australian photographer, uh, many of you may know him for his landscape aerial photography. 
uh, among many other things that he does. But you see the beautiful sense of shape and gesture, that curve as it's coming in, but that use of the diagonal. You see the use of color and toning as it comes through here as the river water comes in to meet the sea. And going back to Kelly again, all of a sudden you see how she's done her composition here. Again, that tension between the two sides. Perhaps the child was not meant to be born alone. Perhaps something has happened. You see the way that she's created that sense of the S curve in the way that she's done her stem. All these things that she intelligently applies to her composition. And most of us just simply say, well, they're just a remarkable photographer and they have great ideas but you start to deconstruct it objectively and you realize all the things they use that they leverage effectively. And that's what we're trying to do is figure out how do we take not just a good, but an effective picture. One that makes people look, one that makes people see, one that makes people enjoy. And I put this picture in here, it's Cindy Harder Sims. She's out of America. Oh, Daniel Tang says, oh yes, John Wick, I love it. I'm gonna look down every once in a while at the chat here. Um, you know, what do we see? Well, we see the man, obviously, and we see the little girl with her teddy bear that's underneath looking for shelter and protection. We see the sense of the books in the office. It tells us something, the chess boards and so forth. It tells us something about the space. We see a man kneeling. We see a church type uh, object on top of his desk. We look up into the picture at the top and we see a hand in the air and what could be a baptismal scene. And all of a sudden, there's so much that's going on in what would otherwise be a relatively simple picture that gives us things that reward us for spending time looking. It's not just about having complexity, as we saw with Kelly's picture of the dogs. It can be simplicity. The key is that we are rewarded for the time that we spend invested in looking at a picture. Another one uh, by... Um, uh, David Bastioni out of uh, out of Italy. You know, what do we what do we do? Well, this is a high key photo. What is he using? He's using color. He's using value. What do we see when we look? Well, we see the cross. We see the flag. We know that it's a corpse. We see the tender way that she's kissing the head. We look and we see that she's in traditional Islamic garb. We then realize she has Mindy on her hands, perhaps signifying that they've been newly married or that there's some sort of something going on between the two of them. We see the bump that's inside of her. And all of a sudden, it's something that is a relatively simple picture becomes very powerful and effective. I believe that's why it went on to win the grand award at WPPI was for those very reasons. We look at something like this by Cheryl Walsh, who does uh, underwater photography out of uh, California. And what do we see? I mean, we see that beautiful shape coming up. We see that sense of the red and the yellow and the use of the colors, you know, the reflections at the top uh, and so forth. But she's using all these different types of things. She's creating atmosphere within her pictures with her underwater photography to present senior portraits in a, a new and different way, doing it underwater. This is one of my dad's, you know, what do you see? Well, you see the girl that's sitting there it's done in a very hopper-esque type style, uh, you know, relatively simple composition, but we see that there's obviously the luggage that's been set down, the suggestion of stickers that they're well-traveled. We realize she's smoking a cigarette. We go back and we look at the man and he's staring at another woman. And we realize that his wife has written to him to say, I'm waiting. In other words, He's got the best thing in the world sitting right there in his bed waiting for him, but he's enamored with the fake, the substitute. It's a powerful story that my dad's creating here. That's true for so many of us. You know, what are our, our things that we, we become enamored with that take us away from the things that are right in front of us and truly precious? You know, I think about this all the times in terms of trying to be present with my kids, with my wife, uh, with my loved ones, with my friends. Uh, don't become so enamored with that thing in front of us that we miss what's right there. This is Steve Scalone, another Australian photographer. What makes this picture remarkable? Obviously, the sense of atmosphere and so forth, the sense of scale that he uses, time of year, the absence of life, and yet the presence of life. But think about it from this standpoint. If the sharpness and amount of detail was consistent throughout the entirety of this scene, would this picture be as effective 
And I would say to you, it would not. Because those buildings by their mass would dominate and overpower the individual. The reason why this picture works is because of their halftone nature in relationship to the dark tone of the individual. And then the trees are there in order to help be able to support and frame. So these are all things that we look at and we can say, oh my gosh, there's so much to be admired in these great artists that are out there. Here's an example of one of my mistakes. You know, I thought if I could just get the pretty model and I just got enough funky props, and literally this is an agency model. I spent $2,000 one day bringing in agency models just to create uh, pictures. And I, I got the cute dresses and I got the, the, the different props to try and make funky things. I think in my mind I was going, uh, you know, hello operator in my head, but this picture falls flat. You know, it's a bit of a fraud. It says to you, look at me. It grabs your attention on some level. But then once you do, you realize that the expression isn't rewarding. The, the overall composition isn't that great. And even the styling is not that effective. The posing could be better. So many different things. It's not believable. You feel cheated after you spend time looking at this picture, thinking to yourself, meh, what about it? In a similar way, on the same day, I went out and I did the classic shot of the beautiful girl in the beautiful dress. It looks like she's going potty in the woods. Why? Why? Right? This is an example of playing photographer or trying to play at doing something creative instead of having a preconceived idea that's already informed by the principles of art and design to begin with that I then just go out and execute. Another example that can be frustrating to people are puzzle pictures. This is a picture that my dad made. A picture where there's so many dots to connect that there's no logical takeoff and landing point. And so we feel confused and frustrated. You know, my dad was trying to do something. This is kind of a nautical type deal. It's of my sister. You've got the looking glass. You've got the sea. You've got the, the fan and so forth. He's using color, trying to make it monochromatic. He's using value trying to make it work, but the picture is not particularly effective because the story itself is not well told. It needs to have more. Another example of a meh type picture is one that I took of a guy for his CD cover. He's on that angled line. It says, do you, sorry, I'm reading here what Eric has to say. I'll finish this thought. He's on that angled horizon line. He's got the guitar. You look at it, it's instantly recognized what the picture is and what it's about. The fact that a texture has been thrown on it isn't enough to make it interesting. And so it's quickly something you can discard and walk away from. It's not a particularly effective picture. Eric is asking a question. Do you think that it's the experience you've had as a photographer that makes you realize these type of things or the way photography is evolving that it makes you look at your past photos differently? Well, great question. Of course, my experiences as a photographer inform the way that I look at things. But uh, honestly, it wasn't until I, you know, it, it's very popular to say to go back and study the old masters and so forth. Um, my father had done that. He'd gone through a life event and uh, he realized he had, had not spent the time uh, studying the old masters as much as he had desired to. He'd kind of been a little too immature in his early years. And of course, I had experience with painters and stuff like that through the university, but I had never really done uh, not in-depth studies of their work, but more in-depth studies of their thinking. What were the conversations they were having? What were they interested in? What were they processing and working through? And so beginning with that, that led through a whole growth period uh, up to the point of photography uh, becoming invented. And, and, and really one of the things I found most interesting is looking at those photographers that are kind of in that 1850s to 1920s range, really the closer to 1850s, 1870s, because for many of them, they all grew up with a foundation in art. They all grew up learning how to sketch and draw and understanding things like perspective and, and different stuff like that from just a drafting uh, point of view. And it was all stuff that they were taught. So they were very closely connected to that. And then they got the medium and, and, and mechanism of photography to go out and, and implement with. Whereas, you know, my father grew up as a photographer in the seventies. I grew up as, uh, as a photographer, let's just say nineties uh, to make it as, as far as when I really started exploring the craft for myself. 
but there wasn't that training or that connection to the past generations. And part of that, at least here in the States is, is somewhat not, as I alluded to, not every, not, not our fault in the sense of uh, the people that canonized the history took a very, um, uh, I'll call it single point perspective, which was the F-64 purist mindset, which really emphasized it was all about the craft. And what you realize is that the people prior to that, even Alfred, Alfred Stieglitz, um, you know, who wound up at that point, and I'll get into that history stuff later if we have time, but basically they were saying, you know, put away the marvelous mechanism that is the camera. Stop being enamored by the marvelous mechanisms and start putting a lot more thought into the content of what's inside of your frame and then allow the mechanism to go forth and capture it, knowing that it's going to distort reality from what your eye sees. And you have to understand how that works. You know, the, the funny thing that that happens uh, when we think about Ansel Adams and his pre-visualization, which all credit to him for, for popularizing it. But the moment of realization for Adams in terms of that was when he was standing there at Half Dome and looking at it, and he held up physically the red filter in front of his eye, and that's when he finally said, ah, now I can see what this picture could be. It took something external from him to allow him to pre-visualize. And what I'd suggest to you in terms of training is, training should be such that you pre-visualize even without that additional aid that's external from you because you've learned how to think. And this is what the people in the 1800s consistently talked about and, and old, old painters and stuff like that. But they all talked about this idea of the mind's eye, right? What can your mind conceive and pre-visualize? Okay. So once we, I, I hope that answered the question. Let me just make sure I can't even get over to it here. Uh, I think your question was, uh, yeah. So is it my experience that made it or is it photography, the way photography is evolving? You know, the way that photography is evolving is just, it's more at a rapid pace. But what you see is that more and more people are churning out work that I would consider to be incomplete. It's, it's pictures that grab your attention only for a second, but it doesn't do what's on the screen right now, which is it has to have something that holds our emotional appeal. So what is that? Well, when we understand the psychological approach to the laws of looking, the emotions of, of looking, also we realize there has to be more. It can't just be impact alone because then you wind up, if it's impact alone, without something else to reward us, that at the end of the day, we're gonna say, meh, what about it? Feel frustrated because it's a puzzle picture or so many different types of feelings which are not rewarding. And our goal mm -hmm. is to reward people. So how do you do it? Well, Mortensen basically identified three broad buckets that you could use in order to be able to create emotional appeal. And broadly speaking, they are this. So on the most extreme end, you have essentially, uh, this is the what we'll call the sexier side of beauty, right? That's something that, that's appealing to everyone, beauty. Whether it's on this sexier side or this is, and this is one of Mortensen's pictures, or this side, which is the softer side of beauty. Either way, it's still beauty. He has this picture here, which is very graphic, right? It has a sensuality to it, right? But the way that the mouths fit together, and this is all being done at a time where everything had to be done in camera. But he did a lot of extensive post-production work as well within the limitations of what paper can handle. A lot of work with exacto knives and paintbrushes and different stuff like that. You know, I put this picture in here only because it helps people uh, just try and problem solve, which is all we do as photographers. We're visual problem solvers. And so when you think about how in the world is he gonna get this picture of the girl on the tightrope? Okay, well, he laid her down on the ground, but how does he get the proper perspective of the scale of the umbrella? And you realize that what he, oh, Brett's here. Good to see you, buddy. And you realize what he has to do here is he has to cut the length of the umbrella. Because if the length of the umbrella is con consistent with what an umbrella parasol would really be, it would push that circle too close to the camera. And as we all know, the thing would make it too big. So, you know, it's thinking like that about how do you, how do you, how do you solve, visually problem solve different things. The next thing besides 
beauty that we can work in is we can work in sentiment and sentiment can go across so many spectrums, right? It is the humble life. It is the simple life. You know, you look at this picture and you basically say, according to the rules, you should never have an elbow at a right angle. And just even the way that her legs are placed. I mean, yes, there's a bit of a bend, but it's a little bit masculine. Uh, the gaze, oh my gosh, the gaze is kind of looking up and out. But then all of a sudden you realize this is a really, rather remarkable picture that does capture your interest because all of a sudden you realize it's that very foundation that he's doing there with her legs that gives her such strength. The right angle conveys the strength. This is not a picture that's meant to be the beautiful portrait. This is a storytelling type picture. We know something about her character. It rewards us for looking. We can all remember times that we have had hard work in our life, whether it's truly in a field or something else. Another example here in terms of sentiment would be a shot like this. At this point, I'd be asking the, if I was in a live situation, I'd say to somebody, okay, identify the composition he used here. Well, he used a triangular composition. You can see it there. One of the keys that you start realizing whenever you wanna have pictures that, that work on certain compositions is you wanna have something that operates as a fulcrum. Something that is that point in the middle that allows it to become that dividing line that our eye goes in and around and up and on. You realize that that triangle shape of the group itself is very effective because it's re the repetition is of the triangle at the pattern at the top, almost suggesting the idea of an hourglass. You look at the sense of gaze, the placements of things, the use of the hands. You realize that no one's looking in the camera except for the one boy. Um, just to answer a question here real quick, Chris Anderson says, how often do you get partway through a project? Perhaps one where you've done a lot of pre-visualization, realizing it's going to have that emotional hold you're looking for and you have to change all the time, all the time. But here's the thing that I generally speaking don't do is I don't move forward with a project until I experience something that is a very clear tell. You know, there is something that we can look for, something tangible that is a byproduct of a good idea. Do you know what that is? It's called happiness. You'll be happy with something when you're ready to move forward. Until you're happy with it, you still need to continue to work on it. And if you realize in the middle of a project that there's something that isn't going to have that emotional hold you were hoping for, that's just your sign saying yellow light or red light, stop, work through this, process it until you're happy again, and then move forward and move forward with confidence. You know, here's a, a, a sentimental type picture. Clearly, it's suggestive of Napoleon. But what has Mortensen done so well here? What is the classic pose that we think of, of Napoleon? Well, it's that arm inside of the jacket. He hasn't done that. But because of his styling, the way that he's done it, he's put just enough information inside of this picture to suggest to us a Napoleonic figure even the way that the neck is pulled in and the jacket is extending and the arms is behind and the belly is bulging and all these kinds of different things. The use of gaze. He's created distance in the background. He's doing this all through tones. Here's one of his pictures of uh, Vermeer. Every artist at some point creates their version, don't they, of Vermeer and the milkmaid. And so this is his homage, so to speak. He hasn't done an exact representation of it, but we all know that light source coming from the top left and moving along, you know, in that particular case, our eyes see this as a very diagonal composition in the way that it works. That's what he's using effectively here. You see something like this. This is the third type of emotional appeal that you can use. So we talked about beauty. We talked about sentiment. And the next one is wonder. And what do I mean by wonder? Well, wonder is kind of twofold. Wonder is that which is amazing to us. It can also be that which frightens us, which is why horror exists as a genre. It's what frightens us. In this particular case, there is so much that tells us about this individual because of the fact that his hair is not perfectly coiffed. It is not straightened. But the reason why that's confirmed to us is because we look at the strings and the way that they're spiraling like this, even the way that he's holding his bow, right? 
There is something mysterious to us about this individual. And there's so much that is telling in the way that we look at it. He took a 20 year old girl and painted her up. And all of a sudden we have that sense through the gesture and the lighting, the use of the dark tones in her fabric. Notice how simplistic uh, a lot of his, uh, his wardrobe is. One of the things that Mortensen observed is that most people try and get too much authenticity and too much detail. We'll go back and just think about that Napoleon picture. If you had had too many medals, too many things that clearly told us this is Napoleon, then all of a sudden it wouldn't be any fun for us to look at the picture because it would be too obvious. And we'd say to ourselves, what about it? Right? Mortensen learned the art of suggestion, of having just enough information there. The claws of her hand, the pained expression on her face, even though she's a 20 year old girl and she would be very beautiful. He's made her up as if she's in a much later stage of life. Mortensen also played off of finding those people that were grotesque uh, and would take pictures of them as characters, or he would use enlarging techniques with the enlarger to lay pictures at a plane so it would stretch different sections. And you realize, oh my goodness, when we go back and look at, at painters, we'll come to one here in a little bit, but El Greco was a classic person who played off of the technique of elongation to provide emphasis. This is one of Mortensen's, which is rather frightening, but you get it, it's the beauty, the contrast of the beast and the damsel. One of Mortensen's here, where you all of a sudden see as he's getting later in his career, his wonderful sense of design and styling, the graphic nature. You think about somebody that's creating work, single capture in camera, right? All the forethought has to go into the perspective, all the different things that you have to get just right. But at the same time, you still need that emotional response and reaction, the expression on the individual. And just think about it. If his eyes were on us, this picture would feel fake. Because if you had that pickaxe coming at you, where would your eyes truly be? They'd be exactly where they are in this picture. That's what makes it feel believable. Now, can we do this in modern day photography? Absolutely. Jerry Guionis. Many of you admire him, dear friend of mine. Now that you know what to look for, beauty, sentiment, wonder. What has he done here? Well, he's playing off of beauty. That's what he's done. This is that beauty that he's doing. All the wedding photographers in the world know how to do this. All the wedding photographers in the world know how to create sentiment. It's all of our pictures with our family and different things like that. A bride and groom's first look. Here's a picture of sentiment. Simple child, simple dog. And we look all of a sudden, we look at the arrangement and we see that we have this strong sense of a dominant mass. Yep. Okay. Aries, Aries giving me the hurry up sign and I'm happy to do it. We look at something like this and there's a sense of wonder that comes in. This is Jen Thornson out of the United States. Wonderful, remarkable photographer. You look at Jerry here. Jerry's doing wedding photography again, only this time he's playing off the sense of wonder, right? By using the reflection of the man in the mirror and having her look through. Very simple technique, very powerful, very effective, only using values, and it captivates us. The framing, the way that it's done is so important. That's what makes it, if the arrangement wasn't done well, this picture would fall, about, fall apart. Lots of people can use this technique. But if the technique is not applied intelligently, then we all go, yep, that's just a trick of technique instead of looking at something and just feeling that sense of wonder. Uh, Ryan Shimbri did it here. And the way that he did this, it caused controversy over how this could be a beautiful picture of a bride and groom, but it works because of the sense of wonder. In a similar way, another American photographer was playing off of postpartum depression. And you get the idea of the sense, you know, all she did was turn the picture. She had the set, she had, she had, had built it. The girl was shot sitting down and she's just rotated it and designed the set accordingly. But it's a very, very powerful picture talking about the difficulties of postpartum. So an incomplete picture is basically this, a picture that lacks impact or subject interest. If you have, let's say, cause you'll know this from experience, you could have beauty, you could have sentiment, you could have wonder, but if you don't have impact, there's no reason for people to look and the picture's incomplete. Conversely, you can have impact alone 
and grab people's attention. But if you don't maintain that subject interest, the picture falls apart. Now, is that it? Nope. If you really want to take it to the next level, it's got to be a picture that's universal. And what do I mean by that? Well, that's a picture that speaks some sort of prevailing truth. Now, that's something that everybody can relate to. So we have this painting by Whistler of his mother. He could have shot or painted her doing many things in the kitchen, in the garden, and so forth. And said he painted this picture of her profile and used shapes and, again, values in order to make the composition work. How do we know this was a particularly universal picture? Well, the U.S. government made it into a postage stamp because it said in memory and in honor of the mothers of America. In other words, it represented all the mothers in its day. That's a picture that's universal. In a similar way, my father took this picture, which is of my sisters, and uh, I won't give you all the backstory of it, but what I will simply say to you is, as they're here, they're reading together and they're connected. This is a picture he took five minutes later. Now you tell me which one, it's the same people except for me, which one is gonna stand the test of time? Which one makes you feel a sense of sisterhood, even if those are not your sisters? Which one is just a nice shot of my family, but not particularly effective in the same sense of being universal? So don't trip. What are some of the common pitfalls? Well, gaze. Raphael was the king of it. Notice how nobody is looking at the camera. This is another one of Raphael's. Nobody is looking at the camera except for the Christ-like figure who's carrying the cross. We can presume it's Christ. This is El Greco playing off of that sense of elongation, extending and elongating heads, extending and elongating torsos, elongating appendages and arms, necks. The key to it is you want to create pictures that are verbs instead of nouns. And what do I mean to it? Mean by that? You want to make a picture that is something. It is family. It is love. It is childhood. Not somebody doing childhood, not somebody doing love, right? It's why we talk as wedding photographers all the time about how that apex of the kiss is not as exciting as the anticipation, right? Here's some of my uh, growing pains playing off of the idea of elongation. You know, if I was to suggest to you this guy was instead of a noun, if I said, uh, you know, if I can't get to a verb, what if I can get to an adjective? Uh, when I look at this, I, I, I get a sense of he's pompous. He's pompous. You look at it, you see the sense of the shape, your eye comes up and around, it follows his finger, it points us back over to the staff, it brings us back up to his eyes, we see the expression on his face. It's the sense of being pompous. It's my explorations in these ideas. We want to reward somebody for participating. Here's examples that my dad has done, you know, beautiful. It's playing off of Caravaggio's Calling of St. Matthew. That same chair is repeated in here, the same sense of the light coming from the right and the window in the back. Now, why is it that the people are rewarded for looking at this? Well, when you really start to understand the way that our eye works and the way that art works, you realize that our eye moves around contours and outlines. In this case, my dad uses the leading lines of the floor to lead you into the dominant mass. It's almost like it's a potato in some way. It's just that nice shape that's there. And that's where our eyes move. But as our eyes move around contours and outlines, we all of a sudden realize, and I did it in this, this type print to make it easy for you to be able to see, we realize that what's so significant is the fulcrum he's put in there, which is the tenderness of the little girl's hand on her mother's knee. And so I'll go back to the picture here. Hopefully I'll have time to be able to digest and see this, but you notice how that hand is in that half tone comes across so well. And you realize all of a sudden why it is that as you look at this picture and you explore all the different things, the colors, the shapes, the story, what it is, the tenderness of that moment, it becomes that, that little bit that just makes you feel good about what it is that you're seeing. So when we're talking about complexity, we can use it in our contours. We can vary our degrees of detail. Rembrandt was the king of this. People often said that he didn't have very good ability to paint hands. I would suggest to you that he absolutely could paint hands. And oftentimes in pictures where he did paint hands in exact degree, he did it very well. He just oftentimes left his hands very loose. Why was that? He wanted to pull our eye upwards. He wanted us to focus not on everything, but on something. 
And so this was a, an exploration that dad and I were doing a self assignment where we had 15 minutes to, uh, well, we basically had one hour from the time the guy walked in until he walked out was the agreement and we would create all these different shots. And so this is one, but you'll notice that there's, you know, the plume that he has there doesn't have the same level of detail in it that other parts of the picture does. We're varying the degrees of detail. So we tell you where to look, but we also give your eye enjoyment as it moves around the picture. Plato says it like this when we talk about composition, find and represent variety within unity such a powerful concept. You see, if you have too much unity, then the picture becomes boring. It needs variety. But if there is no variety, it's like that picture that I took of the, of the cowboy in New York. There is no unity. Our eye does not know where to look. It has no place to go, no place to anchor. So one way to think of it, one way that I often do, is think of it like a chessboard. And you could get a chessboard out yourself. You've got the squares. You've got the grids. You'd set it all up so that you're ready to go or arrange the pieces however you want. For myself, I find the most interesting placement would be if there was only one or maybe two pieces moved because that is the anticipation. How will the game unfold? All we know is how they've declared their initial move. You know, the other thing to keep in mind is that our senses absolutely come into the power of imagination. We can actually taste, touch, feel a photo. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's a picture of Jerry's. This is the absolute appropriate lighting to use for a shot that's done like this. Again, he's just using uh, values. He's using the diagonal. He's using a sense of dominant mass. We can also use gesture to see beyond the pose. And everything has gesture. That's why the clothing we put people in is so important. Now, what do you mean by that? What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this picture by Joe Cognandro. This is water, right? Jay Mizell, a famous photographer in America, uh, was the one that introduced me to this technique of, you know, the walls that we put around somebody, all the different things that go into a picture all communicate to people. This sense of the wave and the movement of it, the gesture of it is so powerful. And when we think about how to pose people, oftentimes we get stuck in a box. If we think about it in terms of gesture, we can communicate in so many different ways. And I'll do this quickly. But if I want to tell you that I'm cold, I could sit here and I could go like this. I could also show you that I came in and I took my jacket and I go like this. I could take my hands and put it in front of me as if it was in front of a fire. All three would be appropriate ways to communicate to you that I'm cold. Which one's the right one? Well, it depends on what I'm trying to tell or communicate within my picture. One of those I'm going to be happiest with to say this is the one that's right for what I'm trying to say. So we wanna connect the dots. Our minds love to connect the dots. An easy way to do it, if you were uh, an English speaking audience would be if you grew up in a, in a world where you knew Mary had a little lamb, your brain can't help but wanna finish it, whose fleece was white as snow, right? Because it's just ingrained within us. What we don't like is when the dots don't have a logical takeoff and landing point, because then that's when people just throw symbols into pictures, but there's no cohesiveness. It is variety, but not within unity. There was another guy named Jerry Interval, photographer in the 70s. He's dead now, um, but he has a website you could go look up. Jerry, J-E-R-R-Y, Interval, I-N-T-E-R-V-A-L. Uh, but he has a whole essay he wrote on the psychology of the viewer building upon uh, the ideas of Mortensen, who he was significantly influenced by. And he basically created this wheel. Now this needs to be viewed in the context of the 1970s, but he basically said, just like you could have color and you could have analogous colors, you could have complementary colors, you could have uh, all sorts of different you know, ways of doing things. He used this wheel to help guide him on ideas of how to put things together, playing off of emotions and feelings. But it always came back to that thing, that sense of wonder, right? He called it the curiosity, but wonderment, mystery. It's what is the motivation for the people for, for whatever's happening within this scene? People are no people at all. What is the motivation for somebody viewing the particular pictures? Now, here's an example of one of mine. You can see I'm playing off the sense of sentiment because it's a child. You can also see I'm playing off the sense of wonder because you realize that the shadow that's on the wall is not something that matches what you're seeing there. And then all of a sudden you realize it's a triangular composition in the way that it's composed. 
And there's just enough symbolism to tell you that there's a story going on. There's a sense of joy. We've all remember that moment of being in front of a fan or imagining childhood. And the photographer themselves is always present in their picture because what you should know is that my father took a picture of me on that same tricycle when I was a little boy. So not only am I present in the picture as a photographer taking the picture, but I literally inserted myself in it because I wanted to do something for my child, for my, for my daughter Holland, who I love. Another example of learning how to see is here where, you know, this is me in, in, at one stage of my growth. Beautiful portrait of the bride. I've learned how to use the light. I've learned how to turn the chest away from light, turn the head back towards it, do all those kinds of things. I'm sure the mother loved it. But my dad was standing next to me and he saw this. And it's the exact same photo in the exact same moment in time. And while I'm coming in tight in love with my 7200 lens, he sees the bigger picture because he has cultivated the ability for his eye to see. At that point in my career, I was so caught up with the craft and making sure I had my exposure and I followed all the steps and I did all the right things that I couldn't, like a surfer, ride on top of the wave and, and, and start to play and have fun and see what's going on and realize, look at the leading lines. Look at that stairway that points you right to the bride. Look at the framing that happens of all the beautiful artwork. What a beautiful setting that this bride is in. Hey, Sarah and Logan. Hi, hi to everybody. Another way to get myself out, out of problem solving is try and take a picture of my, my wife and daughter. This is playing off of Vermeer and realizing our studio wasn't big enough. So all of a sudden it became, I just need to get outside the window. I'll just get a ladder and go outside and then I'll have enough shooting distance. And that allowed us to create this photo. Just a sentimental type picture. Another thing that I'll show you is just kind of as continue to evolve is, you know, here's my dad and kind of playing off some storytelling elements, another little set that we built inside of our studio. Another one we did for a workshop. This is where we're starting to get more sophisticated and teaching people about dual complementary colors and kind of how to make things work. This picture scored well. I'll tell you that the reason why judges were drawn to it was because of the color, right? I used the color and the arrangement, the diagonal and the color to create the impact. This is one we just recently created. Again, kind of playing off that sense of gaze. Intentionally, there's only one person looking at the camera. Everybody else is doing something else. You can see how the dynamic symmetry is coming into play, making sure as best you can, noses are hitting particular points, arranging people in different ways. Oh, let's see if I can get out of that. Yep. So, Aries, you tell me. Hey, Daniel. Uh, you tell me, do we have time to go through um, and talk about some of the Godox shoots we've done and show the videos? Sure. I, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I can uh, either play the whole video or do you want me just to show the pictures and then they can watch the videos on their own? Uh, absolutely. Uh, whatever you like, Luke. Just okay. go ahead with, um, yeah. Go ahead with uh, whatever you think is the most appropriate. Okay. How about I do this? How about I, how about I, um, uh, how about I show one of the videos so they at least get an idea? Okay, sure. All right, so right. This, this first video, some of you may have seen, this was a project that we were, um, uh, Godox graciously asked us to uh, uh, create a behind the scenes video for the V1. And, uh, and so we went out and did it. And so we just tried to build uh, not only a, a photo that would be interesting, but also create a sense of edutainment. And uh, I'd say to you, if you have not seen this video, just know that for about the first uh, two minutes or so, uh, we're just weaving a narrative. Uh, so it's not going to be the, the straightforward, uh, just watch us shoot. Cause honestly, that's not the most exciting thing. The most exciting thing is to see how a story is told. Say that, let's see if it'll play. I'll try one last time. Mm -hmm. That looks good on my side. Okay, I'm just starting to get it up. Okay, I, I can't see it. Here it comes on my end. Looks good. I can hear the voices echoing from my childhood saying, tell the truth, work hard, keep your promises.
Look, I think the audio is off. Oh. I can't hear you. Um, Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. It's good now. Yeah, I don't know why it lost sound. Sorry about that, um, but it did. Uh, so what I'd say to people is uh, just go to Godox's YouTube uh, and you'll be able to see that for both the V1 and the S30, which I'm going to show you here in a second. And I'll just walk you through what it is that we were doing here. So first of all, we came up with an idea of how we wanted the final picture to be. We, we concepted it in our head and figured out what the arrangement would be, how the different people would come in. And when we needed to light the shot, uh, in order to make it work, the most important light, in my opinion, is the one in the bottom left corner of this diagram that says light the ceiling. And here's why. We, we knew we needed to light the different people. We knew we needed two lights double stacked on the left side to strike the, uh, the man who's going to be standing in the doorway to make it feel like there's a sense of, of light coming in from the outside. We knew we needed a light to hit the mother and the daughter who are going to be sitting in the bed. We knew we needed some light to create some separation for the girl that's going to be in the background. But at the end of the day, it became a bunch of directional light. And so the mood of the entire scene wasn't quite correct. So the most important light, the one that blended it all together, made it feel cohesive, was the light that we then ended up bouncing in this left corner up at the ceiling. That's the one that then made this, this picture come together. So what did the picture look like? This is what the picture looked like. You'll notice that, you know, obviously we've created uh, something that is a fulcrum, that element up at the top, which is the antlers. Uh, so as your eye comes in and it looks as the, at the gentleman, and it goes over to the side, it comes back up and it goes down and it moves all around. Uh, but these are the things we've got framing elements pointing you back into the picture. Uh, when you look at the composition, it's following the golden mean. So obviously that works. That's just a natural uh, thing that can happen uh, uh, when you frame in certain ways. And so it's always, you know, if it works, why not use it? Uh, you'll also notice that it, it also works along this type of, of premise. And what you'll realize is when we did this, what we were trying to do is, is play off the idea of alternation of dark and light values. So that's why we have the woman that's in the window against a lighter value in a darker value versus, uh, you know, perhaps the man who's against a dark value uh, with the shadow area behind him. Well, now he's in a lighter value. So you, you alternate these both left to right, but also we alternated them bottom to top. So we've got a dark area in the foreground into a light area, into a dark area, into a light area, into a dark area. Uh, and so that alternation of those values becomes part of what makes this picture effective. Um, you can also see how uh, that this is where I'm just trying to show you that we had that fulcrum there at the top. You can see that we created triangles both in his po posing to point you to look over there with his elbow. His elbow is an arrow that's pointing you to look over at the, the other people. We've created triangles in the way that we arrange the objects. We've created triangles within triangles within triangles. The next video that I would show you is for the S30. This is where we designed a set. These are theatrical type lights. And so we designed a set and Godox was very kind to us in terms of uh, their 30 watt lights. And the set was uh, 12 feet wide and or 16 feet wide and 12 feet tall. So it was a large area that we needed to light. And so uh, they sent us enough lights to be able to accommodate uh, what we needed to do there. So we figured out what we wanted our arrangement to be. And then we figured out what it is that we needed to do to light. So we knew we were gonna have three different levels. We we're gonna have kind of a foreground, uh, uh, a middle ground, and then we needed a backdrop in the back to be the, the, the background. Uh, we do show you a, in the video, we show kind of a quick time, whatever you wanna call it, uh, uh, the fast animation type thing of showing us building the set if you're interested in knowing how to do that a little bit. Uh, but the key thing here was it's one thing to have lights. It's another thing to know what you want to do with the lights ahead of time. And so with that, we created this. So we knew we needed three lights that were graphic that were going to come down and anchor. Uh, we wanted the suggestion of a train station scene. We created a whole skit based around the idea of Buster Keaton and using gesture. We used color theory. We allowed certain areas to fall off into darker shadow. And then other areas we wanted to be more brightly lit so that you knew where to look within the scene. 
And so this was supposed to be kind of an evening time. You'll even see a sense of using the gobos on the ground to kind of give you a sense of dappled light, uh, to, to give reasons for why uh, things could be occurring, the why there's some dappled light on the back wall, why there's some orange lighting that's coming into this particular scene. But if you want to see how this all happened, definitely go watch the video because what you'll realize is it's a comedy of errors that led to this moment in time. And again, we used dynamic symmetry to go forth and, and figure out how we wanted to do our com uh, composition. That's why it's so important to me that the foot of the girls uh, are pointed in a certain way that she's leaning into her mom uh, to play off of that sense of diagonals. The reason why the boy is leaning in, all those things worked off the suggestion of the lines, the diagonal lines that would be within this type of symmetry. And finally, I'd want to talk to you about this guy, a guy named Aries, who won an award for this particular picture. Aries, would you say that this had anything to do with variety within Unity? Or what would you say is the lesson that came into play for the idea behind this picture? Yeah, I um, I think I created this image after the uh, the third class, if I don't remember yep. that wrong. That's yep. Unity 3, Unity uh, VS Variety. Um, um, basically, guys, what I, OK, it's, um, I was, as I've told you in the beginning, I was, I was a bit struggling to put everything together. I, I did uh, fundamental lighting and posing. Technical-wise, I think I, I was sort of there. Yep. Uh, I think I I'm I had my bottleneck at the moment. Uh, like, pretty much, I guess uh, a lot of photographers will feel the same. Like, you technical-wise, you, you are there, but uh, you're struggling to... Like, you know, the, the music you listen, the movie you watch, the person you loved, you know, you're struggling to put them together. So I have this emotional impact of the story I always want to tell. But the problem was um, I was struggling to put them together until I um, I did a class. Uh, it's an online class with, uh, with Luke. That's the complete picture. Um, I guess everybody will take, uh, was taking different you know, different sort of uh, uh, golden nuggets from the class, uh, all my friends did. So what's the golden or golden nuggets? Or one of the golden nuggets for me was unity vs. variety until the moment I feel like, you know, um, we can use uh, the repetitive patterns to mimic all the years or the times being passed. And uh, we can make, create some variety to give this uh, emotional impact to, um, uh, to tell a story, maybe uh, save the best for last. Maybe the, the good things does come at the last. Maybe it's the sorrow make, uh, you know, the, the final things beautiful. And um, yeah, and uh, hopefully makes everybody feels the same or, you know, uh, gives sh people who had similar experience will, sh uh, will, you know, share similar emotional impact. Yep. Uh, that's just the um the 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 story i oh, sorry that's just what i got out from my class um guys i guess um luke has been shared a lot a lot today um like we we nerd about the lighting we nerd about the value we nerd about uh, uh composition we nerd about the color theories there are a lot <laughs> there are a lot um i i was overwhelmed when i first attended luke's class it's 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 a dictionary of of arts history. It's it's not something like posing one two three four five, lighting one two three, and go take this, do your own combination, uh, over uh, come back the sound. It's something uh, you have to take time. You have to do your read uh, read, I guess to do their class, and do your own literature review and do your own homework, and um, I guess uh, then things will. Uh, come around or you know starts to complete from there so i strongly encourage you guys you haven't done his um you know if you couldn't make the wppi or you know any of his offline class uh, uh you know check out his website and do his um do his online online class um that actually um you can arrange your own time i think this is one of the best time you you're sitting at home and you you have a you have a you know rather than struggling with your your training two or three wedding shots this weekend and um, with everything else you do actually have a piece of time and do the uh, do the work I guess do the work uh, for for yourself uh, that's my advice is I would say this that in general it's very natural sorry about that my eye uh, it's very natural for all of us to probably about the first three years of being a photographer 
uh, it's all about uh, the craft. It's all about the craft. Uh, you're just trying to learn the techniques, learn how to do things. How do you do TTL? How do you do, um, you know, how, how do you do off camera flash? How do you do posing? How do you do post production? How, how do you do whatever? Um, but somewhere in that three to five year range, you get fairly proficient with that. And eventually I'd say for a lot of people, when they get 10 to 15, 20 years in, uh, they start realizing there must be something more. You know, what is that something more? And that's when the art side of things uh, that would have been so valuable to you if you had just started out at year one, two or three, learning that and the craft, <laughs> you'd be so much further ahead. That, that's when you kind of start getting the itch to say, okay, um, you know, I've seen enough. I, I now need to really go out for myself, work and develop myself. And, you know, I have my definition of impact that I'm very comfortable with. Uh, that doesn't mean that it has to be yours. I'm not stating it as fact. But what I am stating is this is what I've observed. And this is where my research has led me. And, uh, and I'm very comfortable with it. And I know how to use it now. And I think that becomes the whole key is it's a sense of applied intelligence. There's a, a thought in the 1800s by uh, the photographers there is don't be um, too cheeky with your um, with your art. Don't be too cheeky with your design. Don't try and hide it too much either. Like just allow it to exist. You know, it, it's like saying, you know, a home, if you built a home, of course, there's going to be, you know, walls that support it, right? Let those walls be there, but you don't want them to draw. You don't want to draw undue attention to itself. I think that's always the key is you don't want to try and, and make people feel like they're just looking at a trick. So anyways, thanks for so much for, for tuning in and for being on here to see so many dear friends, Roger Tan. I saw your name on there, Erica. Thank you for being there. I mean, I, I'm just so appreciative of that. Uh, I certainly want to tell you guys how much I appreciate, uh, you know, Godox and uh, their invitations that they've given us to be able to work on things for them. I hope you guys enjoy them. Uh, you know, dad and I, uh, really try and put our heart and soul into it to try and just say, how can we do something that is along the lines of edutainment? It really does need to serve a purpose, which is to showcase the wonderful products that Godox is producing on our behalf to help us as photographers. Uh, oh, I, Eva, thank you. Not only do I have a, a serious sunburn and I'm underexposed, but everybody loves to tell me about how I must have gotten some sun and I always joke because I have rosacea. So it's one of those things where you go, my face is naturally red all the time. So, but my wife still loves me, but it's just part of it. When I start laughing, it gets even worse. Anyways, yeah. Godox does a great job creating products. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for this time to spend with you guys. The real question is, as we try and end every one of our videos, it, it's one of those things is, is once you have these great products in your hands, what are you gonna go and do with them? right? That's the key. What are you going to go and do? And I'd say to you, your problem isn't that you don't have great equipment. Your problem is you don't have any good ideas. So go out there and get some good ideas and then go out and create. I guess, um, I guess in a sense that, uh, you know, a couple of like, let's, let's talk about this five years ago, five years ago, I spent $3,000 on one single off camera flash. That's how expensive it was sure. um, to create uh, the Cavaraggio shot David created, I would imagine, or, you know, the S30 shots you guys created. I need to, I don't know, I need to spend, the, let's say, $30,000 or $20,000 on purchasing lights. But in a sense, nowadays, I, I guess with Godox, um, you know, S30 or even V1, it's actually it's actually the cheapest, um, or, you know, uh, it's the best the one. It's the cheapest it's ever been. It's the cheapest yeah, it's ever been. been. So I guess there is no excuse saying that because of the equipment is too expensive i just don't have the money or to invest and to create i guess nowadays it's your creativity or it's it's you who you know do not in, should you invest enough time on discovering yourself or study and to to become a better person and um to to in, improve to complete your own picture i guess it's only you um standing you know to invest your time into it and to create your own craft i guess that's the yeah, way it is. I, about equipment i'd say this a piece of equipment is never going to solve your problems it solves a particular problem you know godox has come out with the uh the new 80 uh, uh 1200 pro to have 1200 watts in a single head 
is huge, especially because it combines TTL and high-speed sync. However, you may not be in a situation where you need to have 1200 watts. But if you're the type of photographer that, let's say, does pre-wedding photography, that's always having to retouch your assistants or light stands out of your picture. Well, now with 1200 watts, you could have a light that can go anywhere and have enough uh, um, power that you could place your light potentially out of the frame, you know, type thing. Uh, so it solves that problem in a wonderful way. Uh, you know, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, when we talk about overpowering the sun, depending on how light close you get your light to your subject, you can find a way to overpower your sun. Uh, but uh, whether that's using the 200 or 400 or 600 or, or whatever. So, you know, they're all wonderful tools. The, the question is, as I, as I kind of come back to you is, okay, once you have it, what are you going to do with it? And how do you use, how do you use the idea behind your picture to inform what the right tool is? And I think that's where dad and I, enjoy creating is that we don't we don't get stuck with a single light that we say this is what we always have to use we go lights light now let's figure out how to direct it shape it give it quality and know that it's just going to convey mood right that's what it does it's a supporting element and uh, many of my photographer friends who are well known take a lot of pride on their lighting and i want to have great lighting in our pictures but if lighting is all that's great about your pictures then you're gonna have an incomplete picture because people are gonna then look at it and say, okay, what about it? Beyond the great lighting, what else is there within the picture that's gonna make me um, rewarded for looking at it? Yeah, I guess the, I guess what's, um, what's the golden nuggets when I get out of the class is that you have inspiration, right? You, you sort of know who you are, but like for me, I was struggling and says, uh, this is who I am. But I'm I was struggling to have a pre-visualization to create a picture. And then, you know, when once you've done that class with patterns, unity and variety, which Luke mentioned, or the, even the value um, and everything else and composition and um, emotional impact, then there is a bridge from inspiration to a complete picture or pre-visualization. Then lighting comes handy. Lighting is part of it, right? Lighting yep. is just a tool yep. or even color. It's just yep. a tool. So that's how it works. So yep. guys, make sure, um, I know, you know, if you, if you use Godox light, that's great. But uh, if you use other lights, that's fine. But the golden nuggets we want you to get out of here is to look what <laughs> it's i mean to to go 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 have a look at a luke's class and uh websites i guess um yeah. i guess yeah. Yeah, all, all the liter literature review we, we've given you with the first hour rather than talk about the lights i guess that's the golden nuggets here right the, the, the golden nuggets is whether it's led whether it's flash whether it's a powerful flash or it's a uh, a weak flash. It's an on-camera flash. It really doesn't matter other than to solve a particular problem, what your lighting is at this particular time. Your, your excuses are not that you don't have the right equipment. And if you need the right equipment, it's available to you at the best value you're going to ever, in, in history, in history. Exactly. The, the, the key is you have to go out there and start to learn how to create content within your pictures. And then from there, the rest yeah. history. All right, guys, I would like to thank Luke for sharing with us. If you guys uh, enjoy his talk and uh, we, we certainly would organize more, drop us a message below and let us know. And uh, for now on, I will see you guys until next time. Thank you, Luke. Thank you again. Bye. See you guys. Bye.